Oh, wait. This one. Okay. So we finished up the cranial bones of the skull. And I want to go into the facial bones. So you notice here this long list of facial bones here. You have 14 different type and the, uh, there's a number behind the name of the bone that is to indicate that how many bones there are. So if you see a two there, that means it's a paired bone. It means it's a left one and there's a right one. Okay, if there's just this one next to the, the name, then that is going to be a single bone. Okay, so we're going to work through some of these and discuss some of them here. Uh, and there's a lot of bones here on this picture. So I'm just going to move into the individual ones for now. Okay, so we've mentioned some of these and we'll review some, but we're going to go over several new ones also. So we have our nasal bones and those are going to be the bones that make up the bridge of your nose. So you'll have a left and a right nasal bone. Now on a test, I don't expect you to say the left nasal bone or the right nasal bone. Don't worry about that. So they're going to be dead center there, right above or superior to the opening there to your nasal cavity. So here's a picture of the nasal bones, a little bit uh, uh, better uh, magnification here. Okay, so these are your nasal bones right here. You can see your frontal bone is right above them. Right? So now we're going to talk about the zygomatic bone. And there's going to be three structures on the zygomatic bone. If you see there, we have the temporal, frontal, and maxillary process. And so this is going to make up part of your cheek here. So you can see all the different views that we can see the zygomatic bone from. Okay, you have your lateral, okay, you have your anterior view, and then you have the inferior view. <clears throat> so when we're looking here at the zygomatic bone, Right, this is just thrown down somewhere. Right, we haven't really oriented it yet to the correct anatomical position. So you should know all these different parts. Now we've talked about the temporal process. All right, so you see we have this nice rounded edge here and that's gonna be part of the orbit here. So the zygomatic bone, I'm gonna go back a slide here, okay. This right here, here's the zygomatic bone. So it makes up part of the lateral border there to your, to your orbit. So this kind of skinny process, this is gonna go in superior up towards your frontal bone. So this again is called the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. And then you've got this big broad fat uh, uh, process, and that's the maxillary process of the zygomatic bone. That's going to wrap around towards the front of your face, towards your upper jaw. And then this guy right here that's kind of in between, it's not long This is uh, and thin like the frontal process, but we've seen this part before. That's the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. So now what we're going to do is we're just going to flip it into the correct anatomic position here. So of course your eye is gonna be over here, your ear will be back here because we're going back towards the temporal bone here. And then this part here is gonna wrap around towards the front, towards your upper jaw, towards the maxilla. So now we'll put everything into position here. So this tall skinny portion, that's the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. All right, this kind of medium sized process going back towards the ear over here. That's the temporal process of the zygomatic bone. And then you've got the thickened, fatter portion of the zygomatic bone, and that's gonna be the maxillary process of the zygomatic bone. So the zygomatic bone has three processes. And then of course, don't forget about your zygomatic arch there, okay? The temporal process of the zygomatic bone will be two, one of two processes that make up the zygomatic arch. All right, the next facial bone is going to be your lacrimal bone. And so it will be located in the medial portion here of your orbit. So here's the nasal bone, then you got this bone right here, and then right behind it, here's the lacrimal bone. This bone right here, that's the maxillary bone or the maxilla, okay? So it comes down, forms the lateral boundary here to your nasal cavity, and then it goes down here to form the upper jaw there. 
you can see in a little bit more um, uh, detail here. So there's the maxillary, the maxilla or the maxillary bone. And so you can see the lacrimal bone is just posterior to that. And so there's this little indentation here, and that's the lacrimal sulcus or the lacrimal groove. And there's a structure there, it's called the lacrimal sac, and that's where your the tears that are made, all right, by the lacrimal gland, they drain into the lacrimal sac there. So here you can see nicely on this colored skull, here's the lacrimal bone, right posterior, right behind the maxilla or the maxillary bone. Okay, the next facial bone is the vomer. Now we've talked about this bone before. The vomer is one of two bones that make up the bony nasal septum. So you can see it here in the anterior view, it makes up the inferior portion of the bony nasal septum. Here it is from the internal view, you can see it nicely back here. And then here you can see it on our sagittal view. So it makes up the inferior posterior portion of your nasal septum there. That's the vomer. Here it is on a nice zoomed in version of our anterior view of the skull. And then we can see it here from the posterior, or excuse me, the inferior view. All right, then we have our inferior nasal concha. That's that scroll shaped bone here that is gonna be found on the lateral walls here of the nasal cavity. And that helps to swirl the air, makes the air a little bit more turbulent as you're breathing it in through your nose. That's the inferior nasal concha. So you can see here, here's the inferior nasal concha, then right above it, we have our middle nasal concha. The middle nasal concha is part of the ethmoid bone. So the middle nasal concha and the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone are both parts of the ethmoid bone. And then you can see your vomer right down here. All right, so here's everything right at you. She, so by now, you should have all of those structures labeled in your atlas. So if not, you should probably do so. Okay, so we talked last class about the palatine bones. So now we're just going to show you on our models here uh, parts of the palatine bone. Because if you recall, the hard palate is made up of two bones, the maxilla and the palatine bones here. So now you can see right on the inferior view here, here's the roof of your mouth or your hard palate. So the anterior two thirds of your hard palate is made up of the maxilla. Specifically, this portion is known as the maxillary process. And the posterior one third is made up of the palatine bones. Well, that flat portion that you're looking at specifically for the hard palate we, we call that part of the palatine bone the horizontal plate. So let me go back to the previous slide here. So this flat portion here, that's the horizontal plate of the palatine bones. All right, so this right here is the horizontal plate of the palatine bones. So it's probably, it might be tough to see, but pretty much everything below this red line that I'm drawing is going to be the palatine bone, but specifically the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. Everything above that line is gonna be part of the maxilla or the maxillary process. So you can see the, the horizontal plate of the palatine bones a little bit better here on this colored skull. Okay, there's the horizontal plate. Now we're gonna throw everything together here for the hard palate in a moment and I'll show you. So we're gonna look at a couple of these structures of the maxilla. So again, 
you can see here in the anterior view, this whole teal colored bone, that's the maxilla or the maxillary bones. I don't know why this is colored in here. It should not be. That's part of the ethmoid bone. All right, so let's look at some of the structures. You'll notice these two holes below your eyes, all right, are the orbits. Those are the infraorbital foramen, or for plural, foramina. Okay, just to go back, the infraorbital foramina. Again, a foramen is a rounded hole in which something's going to pass in or exit out of. So here you can see the different views of the maxilla here. All right, our lateral view, okay, then the inferior view, then you can see the bone all by itself. No, that's a great, that's a great question. No, and that's that it's it's nice that you asked me that question, except I will answer that question in chapter 16. That's the last chapter for this course. Um, and I'll show you the tear ducts there. Hopefully I'll remember that you asked me that question, Rachel, um, and I can point that out to you. But your tear ducts are going to be located uh, higher. They're gonna be, um, come on computer. They're going to be over here. Well, when you're referring to tear ducts, there's the, the lacrimal glands sit up in this area here. And then they produce your tears and then they'll wash across the surface of your eye and then they'll drain over here and into your nose. We get, we'll talk about that. It'll be fun. Then I get to explain to you folks why when you have a good cry, why you get a snotty or runny nose, because everything drains into your nose. So going back to the maxilla, all right, the upper jaw, okay, you're gonna see, and you can feel it. If you run your fingers above your lips there, you'll feel these bumps there, these depressions and these elevations. And those depressions and elevations are called the alveolar process of the maxilla. Well, you're talking about the tiny holes there. Um, when you pull your eyelid down, you'll see a little, a little tiny hole at the top and bottom. Yeah, okay. And yeah, those are the tear ducts, all right? They're called the... The, the anatomical term is the puncta. You have a superior and an inferior lacrimal puncta. And yes, the, your tears will drain into those holes there. And then they'll drain into that lacrimal sac I was telling you about into the nasal lacrimal duct that will run into your nose. So you're close. It's just that, that um, the infraalveolar, excuse me, not infraalveolar. Come on. Your infraorbital foramina are down here, where the puncta will be more so over in this area here, here, and here. If you can, if you, if we put the eyelids in and everything, where your eye is right there. That's awful. I don't, my computer keeps messing that up. Absolutely, your tear ducts can get clogged. And uh, in some cases, you know, the result will be very watery, runny eyes. I mean, it's not uncommon for them to get uh, clogged up. <clears throat> but yeah, if you've ever woken up in the morning, you get those little uh, crusties there in the corner of your eye. Oh, I can't remember the name of the condition off the top of my head now. I actually had it when I was a kid where I woke up a couple mornings and my eyes, I couldn't open up my eyelids because um, they were all crusted together. Ah, I can't remember. Yeah, eye boogies. <laughs> yes, exactly, eye boogies. That's what we call them. Uh, it'll, it'll, I'll remember it probably tonight when I'm uh, lying in bed uh, trying to go to sleep. Um, but it's this condition where you just get these I mean, it gets so crusty and that and the, uh, those secretions can dry up and clog up those pores there. 
All right, so again, those ridges and depressions are the alveolar processes of the maxilla. So we'll see it here. You can see it a little bit better, all right? These bumps there. All these little rays, the, these ridges here and these depressions. Though that is the alveolar process of the maxilla because you have alveolar processes of the mandible down here. So you have to be specific. You can't just call it alveolar process. All right, you gotta be specific as to the bone because you have some for the maxilla and you have some for the mandible. You can see them really nicely here, right across here. Those are the alveolar processes of the maxilla. So here's a great picture, okay? There's your infraorbital foramen. And then there's the alveolar process of the maxilla. All right, so going back now to the hard palate. So like I said, the anterior two thirds of your hard palate is made up of the maxilla, but specifically we're going to call it the palatine process of the maxilla. Okay, so again, it's tough to see. Well, actually, here's that suture line between the uh, palatine bone and the maxilla, and there's all three. So now you can kind of see, okay, below the line, that's the horizontal plate of the palatine bone. Above the line is the palatine process of the maxillary bone. You can see it nicely on this colored skull here. Okay, so let's talk about the mandible. Okay, Mo the only movable bone of your skull here. So again, here are all the different views of the mandible and we're gonna go through all of them right now, okay. So here you can see this structure here that looks like a shark fin, that's called the, the coronoid process. Now folks, um, as you're looking at this and writing some of this uh, down, um, you should know that there are other structures in your body, in your skeleton, that are called a, the coronoid process. So you need to be specific if you're talking about the coronoid process of the mandible, you have to give the full name. The coronoid process of the mandible. Then behind it, this guy here makes up your temporal mandibular joint. So that's the condylar process of the mandible. And then that dip in between both of those processes, that's the mandibular notch. Okay, that's the mandibular notch. The ramus of the mandible is pretty much this vertical portion of the mandible. That's the ramus. Then the body of the mandible is gonna be the horizontal portion of the mandible that way. So the ramus goes up and down. All right, the body goes from side to side. And then, like I said before, your mandible also has an alveolar process too. So you have to say the alveolar process of the mandible. So we, I know what you're specifically referring to. Alveolar process of the mandible. And then you'll have a hole here. That's the mental foramen. That's absolutely correct. Yep. That is where you will feel some popping going on. Yep, Rachel, that's correct. So when you get that clicking or popping sensation going on in that joint, it's the, that, um, the condylar process that'll be moving around in there. There's a couple other structures in there too. So you can see there's the body of the mandible. That's that horizontal structure there. Okay, and then you can see, 
All right, the alveolar process of the mandible, and then you've got your mental foramen, and, there, and there's one on each side. You got one over here, and you got one over here. All right, and then that nice bump in the center is the mental protuberance, you know, on the back of your skull where you felt the, felt the external occipital protuberance. Well, you've got your own little protuberance, a little bump there on the chin, and that's known as the mental protuberance. And then on the inside of your jaw is the mandibular foramen. And so you got a nerve that enters into the jaw there, and that nerve is going to innervate the teeth down there on that quadrant of the jaw. And so it's right around that area where the dentist sticks their needle to give you the anesthesia, the Novocaine there, when they're gonna do some dental work on you. The name of the nerve, you don't really need to know it, but it's called the infraalveolar nerve. And that's the nerve that innervates the, the, the uh, sensation there on your teeth and jaw. You can see it, it's, there's really not a hole that you can see easily. Okay, but the mental frame, or excuse me, the mandibular foramen is right around there. All right, so let's quickly talk about the sutures. We've labeled them, but we really haven't talked about them. And we're going to talk about the sutures in chapter nine, okay, when we talk about articulations, right, the joints there. Okay, yes, they're removable joints, so there's very so they're highly stable. The more stable a joint is, the less motion and movement that it has. So it is connected by dense regular connective tissue. All right, well, we know that that's very strong. That's some of the strongest tissue in your body. All right, so we have these sutures all over the place in our skull. And so we're going to name them all right, um, right now. So we have the coronal suture and the lambdoid suture. The coronal suture, this is the one that we saw, that's going to separate your frontal bone from the two parietal bones, your left and right parietal bones. And the lambdoid suture okay, is way in the back, and that's going to separate the occipital bone, again, from the two parietal bones, the left and right. And we call it lambda because of the shape of it, like a triangle. All right, so here's your coronal suture. You can see how it separates. There's a bunch of different views there that you can look at. Okay, so here you can see it from the lateral part. You can see it nicely here from an anterior view. Right, a lot of times you'll see it from the superior view. You can see how it divides the frontal bone from the two left and right parietal bones. So here are your two parietal bones here. And the frontal bone. There it is with the line drawn over it. Let's take the line away. Whoops, hold on one second. There it is right there. Okay, so there's the frontal bone above that red line, and then underneath that red line are our two parietal bones. All right, here's the lambdoid suture sitting right here in the back. Okay, nice picture of it. You can see it goes from left to right. That's exactly right. This is like a puzzle piece. And so you'll notice in the lambdoid suture, you'll have what we call sutural bones. And these bones sit in the sutures. They're not present in everybody, but they're present in some people. And they're just areas of what we call secondary ossification centers, right, that just ossified later on. All right, so here you can see the lambdoid suture from the lateral view. Here's the occipital bone from the posterior view, parietal bones from the posterior view, and then you can see the lambdoid suture um, from the superior view there. All right, and there's the lambdoid suture on our posterior view of the skull, separating the left and right parietal bones from the occipital bone. You 
dent-like area. Um, are you referring to down in here? Yeah, um, there's not a really a specific name for that. That's where you're gonna have your nuchal lines though. But this angle here, the skull is looking upwards slightly. So that's not really true. It's um, still kind of the back of your skull there, depending on that position. But there's really not a name for that area. Oops, sorry about that. There's the lambdoid suture. Here it is without the red line there to obstruct the suture. Okay, a few more sutures that you need to know, the sagittal suture and the squamous suture. Sagittal suture is gonna divide the left and right parietal bones from one another. The squamous suture is going to be found in between your temporal bone and the parietal bone that sits superior to it. I've already mentioned the uh, sutural bones there, okay? Again, they're not always gonna be present, okay? But they are ossification centers that you can see that are still visible. All right, so there is your parietal, excuse me, your um, sagittal suture, dividing the left and right parietal bones from one another. Okay, you can see it here on this view, the superior view, with the coronal suture being identified. And so there's the, both of those sutures. And then you have your squamous suture found in between, okay, the parietal bone right here and your temporal bone down here. And that's the squamous suture. And it runs from the occipital bone all the way to the sphenoid bone here. So here's your temporal bone, there's the parietal bone. Squamous suture. Right on, right on. All right, and then the sutural bones, you can see right back there in the lambdoid suture, most commonly found in the lambdoid suture, but they can appear in other sutures. So sutures over, over time will eventually completely close, and then eventually the bones will fuse. So it's just worth noting when they usually close. I mean, the coronal suture closes relatively early compared to uh, your squamous suture, early 20s. Sagittal suture in your 30s, lambdoid 40s. Look how late the squamous suture closed, 60 plus years. And in some cases, it might not even occur at all. So we'll use these sutures if they're completely fused. It kind of gives us an idea if you find a skeleton somewhere, all right, um, the age of that person, all right, when they passed away, depending on when these, uh, uh, um, sutures actually uh, closed up completely and fused and then the bones fused with one another. All right, um, basically this slide here is showing you the orbital complex, all the bones that make up the orbit. Uh, if you, we'll just run through that real fast here, okay? Here's your orbital complex, all the bones. So the superior border to the orbit is gonna be made up primarily of the frontal bone, okay? Then you'll see a good portion of the posterior part of the orbit being made up of the sphenoid bone. Then when we get to the lateral portion and the medial portions, let's go over here, the lateral portion, there's the zygomatic bone making up a good portion of the lateral border. And then you'll see on the medial, side of it, we've got the maxilla, and the maxilla will make a part of the medial border and um, a good portion of the orbital floor, all right? Then the lacrimal bone, even as small as it is, will make up part of the medial border here for the orbit. And then the ethmoid bone, which is way back here, okay, will make up part of that medial border. So there's three bones that make up the medial border, the maxilla, okay, your lacrimal bone, and then your ethmoid bone. And then the zygomatic bone, pull back over here, will make up a small portion of the floor here to the orbit. I didn't mention that. 
but mainly it's going to be a lot of the max maxillary bone. All right, um, nasal complex, good with that. Parasinal, uh, excuse me, paranasal sinuses. These again, we talked about briefly. All right, those sinuses, which a sinus is a, a space inside the bone, helps to make the bones lighter. Okay, and we'll also see. In these sinuses, it'll have a lining that's uh, which, which is the mucous membrane, right? One of our four membranes, and its job is going to be yes to help humidify and warm to the air that you breathe in. The humidity is really important because dry air can dry out the mucosa there of your upper uh, and lower uh, respiratory system there. Okay, so we have our ethmoidal, frontal, maxillary, and sphenoidal sinuses. And that's what you're seeing here. And we've already looked through all those. So I'm just going to kind of skip through that. All right, skip through that. All right. Um, it's worth mentioning, we'll talk more about these bones later on when we get into chapter 16. The auditory ossicles, these are the three smallest bones in your body. Okay. The incus, the malus, and the stapes. Those are the three smallest. And you can actually see these here pictured on this penny to kind of give you an idea the scale of the auditory ossicles. I'll go into more detail in chapter 16 about that, okay? I always tell folks the stapes reminds me of a staple. That's how I remembered it, okay? All right, hyoid bone. Love this bone, all right? Because it does not articulate with any other bone in the body. How cool is that? Okay, it sits just in front of C5, which is the fifth vertebrae in your neck. And basically it's present there because it's an attachment site for some of the muscles from your tongue and some of the muscles of your larynx, your voice box. Okay, but it does not articulate with any other bones. So when you're looking at it in an x-ray, it just floats right out there. Okay, it sits right out there. It actually sits right above your thyroid cartilage right here. Holy moly, why isn't this going? There we go. There's your thyroid cartilage. So it sits right above it, superior to that. All right. So on a test, you'll see this slide, and it'll ask you to name it, and you'll say that's the hyoid bone. You don't have to worry about all these parts to the hyoid bone. I won't ask you that. I'll just ask you to identify the bone. Okay, so if you see this, it is the hyoid bone. Don't miss that, please. It's not the jaw of a baby. All right, so how do we tell the difference between male and female skulls, male and female pelvis, right? We call that sexual dimorphism, how we're able to differentiate the male uh, skeleton from the female skeleton, okay? So in general, a female feature for the skeleton is going to usually be smaller. I don't know if I necessarily call it more delicate because that infers fragility, okay? Um, but usually it's gonna be smaller. Unless we're talking about the pelvis, then there's a different story. But when we're talking about the skull, okay, the female skull will be smaller, okay? The male skull will be larger and bulkier, right? Um, we'll skip that part. All right, one of the last parts that I want to mention when we're talking about the skull is the, the infant skull, the baby skull, right? You have these soft spots called fontanelles. And these fontanelles are going to be these soft areas found in between some of the bones, the cranial bones in the skull, right, that's made up of dense connective tissue. And it allows for those cranial bones to kind of slide by each other, okay? So it actually makes it easier on the skull during a vaginal delivery. As the baby is moving through the birth canal, ideally, they'll be going head first. And so these spontanelles allow for that flexibility there for those cranial bones 
not to be mashed into one another, right? So we have several fontanelles that we're gonna talk about right now, okay? So the first fontanelle is the anterior fontanelle. This is the largest one. Because it's the largest one, it usually closes late. All right, well, let me go back here. Anterior font fontanelle will usually close around 15 months. All right, prior to that, the, mat, uh, the posterior fontanelle uh, will take about nine months to close. The smaller ones, the mastoid and the sphenoidal fontanelles, those will close even sooner than that. So there's the anterior fontanelle. You can see how big that thing is. Okay, here's the posterior fontanelle. Much smaller, closes faster. Then you can see your sphenoid fontanelle and the mastoid fontanelle. Mastoid fontanelle is gonna be close to the mastoid process over here, okay? Sphenoid fontanelle is gonna be close to the sphenoid bone right here. All right, there's another picture of the anterior fontanelle. And then you'll also notice there's what we call a metopic suture. Okay, the metopic suture basically, and again, not to take up too much time, but when you're developing as a fetus, right, you go through a lot of different changes and you go through a bunch of different developmental stages. And part of those developmental stages requires some folding. Okay. And so the left part of your body and the right part of your body will fold anteriorly, all right? And you'll get where they meet up in the center here, okay? Normally, this will fuse together. It's just a natural occurring phenomenon, okay? And so in this case, there wasn't complete fusion there in the frontal bone. So you have what's known as a metopic suture. You can see the remnants there of where the bone was supposed to fuse completely together. And again, there's the anterior fontanelle with part of the metopic suture there. Oh, the vertebral column. Um, I'm going to stop the slide here. Let me see where I'm at. Okay, not bad, not bad. We've done good. I want to do some labeling here. And then if we have time, whoops, if we have time, I'll come back and we'll do some of the vertebral column uh, stuff. So let's pull up, quick review here now. Okay. Okay, so let's make sure that you have everything. If you have already had your atlas out, awesome. If you didn't have it out, get it out, okay? So we're gonna do some quick labeling here so you've seen all of this stuff, right? Here's the maxillary bone, the body of the maxilla, all right? It's referring to that main area there, okay? This is a great picture because you can see, all right, how the, the bone itself is colored so you can see the contrast between the other bones, okay? Do we ever ask you this? No. The body of the maxilla, usually if the arrow is pointing to that area, we want you to tell us what bone it is. Okay, there's one of the openings there beneath the orbit. So we call that the infra, infra below, infraorbital foramen. All right here, you can see the infraorbital foramen on this model, just inferior or underneath, all right, the orbit there. And here are the alveolar processes of the maxilla. Be specific as to what bone those infraalveolar processes belong to. Here it is on this lateral view of the maxilla. Those are the alveolar processes of the maxillary bone or the alveolar processes of the maxilla. Then you can see it laterally here on this bone. Okay. 
All right, and then one more view of the alveolar processes. So nice view there. All right, now the inferior view of the skull, you can see the palatine process of the maxillary bone. All right, that's gonna make up the anterior two thirds of the hard palate. And you can see it on this model too, the palatine process of the maxillary bone. <laughs> You're talking about the emperors, Emperor Palpatine or Senator Palpatine. Don't get me started on Star Wars. I'm one of the biggest science fiction nerds that you probably know. All right, here is the zygomatic bone, one of your facial bones, makes up part of your cheek here, okay? Here you can see it on the colored skull here. So it makes up the lateral boundary for your orbit there, and part of the floor of the orbit. So you have a couple processes coming off of the zygomatic bone, okay? So here, right there, that where that arrow is pointing to, that's the temporal process. So your ear is going to be back in this. So your ear is going to be over here, okay? So this is going to come back and form the zygomatic arch. So that's the temporal process. Here's the frontal process. The frontal process is gonna be nice and skinny and slender, and it's gonna be adjacent, okay, to this nice, smooth, rounded border here. That's the frontal process of the zygomatic bone. And then that big, thicker, wider uh, process, that's the maxillary process of the zygomatic bone. And that's gonna wrap around and head towards the nose. So now you can see all the processes, okay, in relation to the other cranial bones and facial bones. Good chance, there's a good chance you're gonna get one of those processes or, or uh, identification of the zygomatic arch. I can, pro it's very, very likely, okay? For whatever reason, the test likes to ask you that. All right, there's that lacrimal bone, that small bone on the medial border there, all right, on the, uh, of the orbit there, lacrimal bone. And then you can see the lacrimal bone, that arrow is specifically pointing to the lacrimal sulcus. And then you can see it one more time, your lacrimal bones, all right. Okay, then we have our palatine bones and that's, that makes up the posterior one third of your hard palate. And so that is gonna be the horizontal plate of the palatine bones. Horizontal plate of the palatine bones. And you can see it on the inferior view of this skull. All right, those are your palatine bones. All right, on to the mandible. Okay, that shark fin shaped structure is the coronoid process. There's three O's in there, C-O-R-O-N-O-I-D. Now life will get a little bit more confusing here in a week or so when we start to go over a couple of the other bones in the body because there are some structures that have similar spelling to this. Okay, I won't bring their names up now to confuse you. So all right now, just know that that shark fin structure is the coronoid process of the mandible. Then you have that dip there, that's the mandibular notch. And then just behind or posterior to the mandibular notch is the condylar process of the mandible. See, there's the mandibular notch. And then just behind it, Condylar process of the mandible. All 
All right. You can see the ramus of the mandible there. That's that vertical portion of the mandible. All of that is the ramus of the mandible. And then you can see the body of the mandible, which is going to be the horizontal aspect to that bone. All right, so much like the maxilla, the mandible has its own alveolar processes. And those alveolar processes are basically where the teeth, they fit into the, into the uh, bone like a peg in a socket. And so what you're feeling is, is that area of the mandible or the maxilla, depending on where you're uh, 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 palpating or touching, okay? where uh, the teeth are inserting themselves into that portion of the bone and it creates those raised areas there. It's a nice view there of the alveolar processes of the mandible. There's your mental foramen. And here you can see two mental protuberances, one bump on each side. Anytime you have a bump here on the mandible, it's referred to as the mental protuberance of the mandible. This is showing you two, you can have one, you can have two. All right, and then there's the mandibular angle where the ramus, this portion of the mandible meets the body. You can feel it on your own jaw. It's that corner there. <clears throat> That's the mandibular angle. All right? And then on the inside of the mandible, you have the mandibular foramen. Okay, it's the only structure on the inside of the jaw that you have to know is the mandibular foramen. Again, your mental protuberances of the mandible. Okay, some more uh, facial bones. There are the two nasal bones. Here's your inferior nasal concha. And here you can see the inferior nasal concha on this model. And then we can't forget about our unpaired bone, the vomer, and all the views that you can see it from. The anterior view makes up the uh, inferior portion of the bony nasal septum. Then you can see it here on the sagittal view. And then you can see it here from the inferior view. <clears throat> Three different views. And then the, there it is again on the anterior view. I'm trying to show you all the different ways that we can show you these structures so you're not thrown you know, off, off guard. Yeah, there's our baby jaw, the hyoid bone. Don't write that on the test, by the way. It's the hyoid bone, the bone that sits right in front, right, of your neck. Doesn't attach to any other bone, but a bunch of ligaments and muscles attach onto it. Here are the three auditory ossicles. Okay, the incus, the malus, and the stapes. These are the bones that vibrate inside of your inner ear. They amplify the sound waves. Without these fellows, it would be very difficult for you to hear things. I'm gonna skip that slide. All right, sutures. <clears throat> sutures, starting off with the coronal suture. Okay, you can see all the different views that we can see the coronal suture from. Let's look at this 
right? There's the coronal suture with the black dotted line over it. Let's remove that line. There you can see the coronal suture in its entirety. Also known as the frontal suture, okay? I don't refer to it uh, by the frontal suture, but if you'd like to, you can. <clears throat> then we have our sagittal suture. That's the suture that divides the left and right parietal bones. There's the sagittal suture. Now we'll remove that black line so you can see it in its entirety. All right, our next suture is the squamous suture. This is going to divide the parietal bones from the temporal bone, okay? Also known as the squamosal suture. Okay, there you can see it without the line there. Then we have our lambdoid suture, the suture that divides the two parietal bones from the occipital bone. There's the lambdoid or lambdoidal suture. I go back and forth on, how, on which uh, terminology I use. Okay, there it is again, lambdoid, lambdoidal suture. And then our, our sutural bones. Okay. Then we have our soft spots, the fontanelles. There's the anterior fontanelle. Now you might see, I should tell you this now, you might see fontanelle also spelled okay. Either or spelling is okay. Okay. Either or is fine. Okay, there's the anterior fontanelle once again. There's the posterior or occipital fontanelle. There's the sphenoid or sphenoidal fontanelle. Then you've got your mastoid or mastoidal fontanelle uh, back more towards the posterior portion near the mastoid process. Okay. So let me go back here now that we finished up that part. Let's jump back here. And I just want to start a little bit in the vertebral column. We're, we're finishing up here um, the axial skeleton soon. We're going to go over the vertebrae and then we're going to go over the thoracic uh, cage there. And so I want to just get a little bit into the vertebral column because we've got a little bit of time here. All right, um, so let's talk about the vertebral column. Important that you know, this is the, this is the, the, um, the midline, the median border of, of your axial skeleton. And so we have 24 vertebral bones, okay? And that includes the sacrum and the coccyx. Coccyx is also known as your tailbone. So some of these vertebrae, right, that we're going to talk about, at one point, um, they were all by themselves, and then they fused. Like, for example, the sacrum used to be made up of five individual bones that all fused together to form one single bone, similar to the, with the coccyx also, okay? So its job... <laughs> it might be just you, Rachel. Oh, really? How does it sound now? Is that a little bit better? <laughs> it is me. It doesn't sound better? Hmm. Arigato, Mr. Roboto. Yeah, Domo Domo. Hmm. Well, fine. 
If you guys want to stop the class and make that up and say that it's sounding like that. All right, you know what? I'm going to stop here.